Glory to God. Well, would you turn with me this evening to the book of Proverbs? Proverbs, what chapter? That's right, chapter 4. Well, how was it Sunday? I heard it was really good. Glory to God. I'm not surprised. Well, it's good that we can be in both sides of the country at the same time. And we got the tools and got the resources, and I know you certainly don't feel shorted. In fact, you know, if I don't go out often enough, people say, when are you going out, Brother Keith? <laughs> when are you going out? Well, <laughs> I could go out a lot, but, <laughs> but we're all going to be led, right? <laughs> we're all going to be led. But, you know, uh, time is short, isn't it? Uh, Phyllis and myself and you, too need to be doing everything we can do to reach people for Jesus because the next thing you know we're going to look up and this thing's going to be done. Done. Over. Have you found Proverbs? If you have not been with us, let me inform you that we have begun on a series on Friday nights here that we are calling the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God. And we're very excited about it. Yeah, amen. I said we're very excited about it. Yeah, yeah, we are. We are. Because we are hungry for the wisdom of God and we are beginning to see what's available to us and how much higher we can operate and function in the very wisdom of God Himself. How many read your uh, chapters this week? Let me see. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's not every hand. And, of course, we don't understand that. Because everybody at Faith Life Church reads their chapter every day, Monday through Friday. Every day. Uh, no, no good reason why not to. It's a... You know, sometimes I think people don't understand, if you put God first, it shows up in your lifestyle. People say, I love God with all my heart, God's first in my life. Well, it's easy enough to say that. But if that's true, then the, the Bible comes first. And reading and feeding on the Word comes first. And praying comes first. And church comes first. Am I right? Yes. I mean, if you go for months and months and you don't go to church and you don't pray and you don't read your Bible, then I'm sorry, but God is not first in your life. That's right. That's right. Amen. Amen. Did you hear me now? Yes, sir. Some say, well, well, yes, he is. No, something else is that you're doing instead of this. Right? Because people who are serious about God, they pray. People who are serious about God read their Bible. People who are serious about God go to church. People who are serious about God give and work, right, in the kingdom. Other folk are too busy with their own life. And uh, maybe, they, maybe they have been born again and they, they're saved, they know God, but God's not first in their life. Their career's first or their family's first, their kids are first or uh, something else is first. And that's not okay. I said, that's not okay. Who's supposed to be first? God. Seek ye first. The kingdom of God. And that's what we've been talking about on Sunday. The, ki the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things that the Gentiles are putting first and working after all the time, the world is, they'll be added to you. And it's so much nicer instead of running after something and using your life up to get something, to have it added to you. Yeah. Instead of scrambling and begging and barring and crying, squealing to get it, let God add it to you in the right way at the right time. Uh, maybe Phyllis will tell you about this sometime, but she had been believing. I have a, a, you know, a part of the house downstairs 
where I've got my books and my tapes and, and I've got a, a bed and I've got a place where I can get quiet and get off by myself. And I've had that for years. And Phyllis has been leaving for some furniture for me. A particular kind of uh, bed and dresser and nightstands and stuff. She found pictures of it how long ago? 10, 15 years ago? 10, 15 years ago. She'd been holding on to those pictures and believing for it. Well, this past week was my birthday. And God put it together supernaturally. I mean, put a deal for it. This stuff was actually discontinued. Well, it's been around, you know, they've been 10, 10 or 15 years. But there was one set of it brand new in a warehouse, like only one they could find in the country. And got, because it was discontinued, got an amazing deal on it, she said. And so it's in the house. And it's nice. It's nice. Everybody say 10 years. Well, you just keep believing. Right? You know, uh, Brother Kenneth and Miss Gloria Copeland, the Lord's given them a wonderful house. We've had the privilege of staying in a number of times. Wonderful, wonderful. But what a lot of people don't know is that uh, Miss Gloria uh, did that. You know, she'd look through magazines, uh, furniture and house magazines and architectural stuff, and uh, sometimes go through three magazines and pull out two pages of something that stood out to her, and she made these little files. This is, you know, this room, and this is for the kitchen, and this is that. They, she did that for 30 years. Everybody say 30. 30 years. Now, see, a lot of people talk about faith, but it's through faith and patience that you inherit the promises. I mean, anybody can believe God and pray for three weeks. But when it stretches out into year after year after year after decade, that's when people cast their confidence away and they just quit and they, they lose their focus. And I don't know how long it was. I don't know if it was that long, but uh, I think it was some 15 or so years or maybe longer, the property where the house is built, they had that, but they didn't have, you know, the house there. Uh, he and she would go out there sometime, sometime take them a picnic basket. And sit out there on the ground and talk about, we're going to put this over here, and then we're going to build this over here, and we're going to do this 15 years on the land. There. And she's, she's putting her stuff together for 30. Well, it's sitting there now, paid for. It's outstanding. It's outstanding. How many know you've got to stay with it? And you've got to stay after it. Keep your vision in front of you. Don't get weary in well-doing. Is that right? And if you do, then you don't faint, then you'll surely reap, won't you? And at the right season, you will reap. Have you found Proverbs 4? Yes, sir. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 1. Hear ye, children, the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also and said to me, Let your heart retain my words, keep my commandments and live. Get wisdom. Everybody say get wisdom. Get understanding. Get understanding. Say that. Forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve you. What will preserve you? Wisdom. Wisdom. Love her, and she shall keep you. What will keep you? Wisdom. But you got to what? Love it. Love wisdom. Right? Do you love wisdom? So you can't be... Uh, ambiguous about it. You, you can't be passive about it. Well, yeah, it'd be nice to have wisdom. Nah, you got to hunger for it. We've already read about that, didn't we? We, we read over to where it talks about wisdom is crying in the streets. Yeah. Right? Yes, and we found out something else has to cry. 
We got to cry. We found the other passage. We got to cry out for wisdom and desire it and hunger for it. There's too much passiveness among Christians. There's too much spiritual laziness. Well, if it followed me, I'd take it. My granddad, Quinnon Nelson Moore, QN, they called him. <laughs> He's a character. Uh, he used to tell me as a little boy, I, I didn't understand why he'd tell me this story over, over and over again. He'd tell me this story. One of his biggest convictions was be a man and work. <laughs> I mean, he had it strong. I was 16 years old one time, uh, helping him uh, with cut wood. And I mean, I'm cutting wood. I mean, I'm, I'm, he's cutting and I'm loading. And he's far ahead of me. And I'm, I'm slinging wood, man. I'm, I'm sweating and I'm working. And I thought I, was, I thought I was really doing it, you know. And finally, he put his saw down. He said, boy, if you're not going to work, go to the house. <laughs> Golly. I thought I was working. <laughs> well, I ain't going to the house. So, man, I, we had to you know, really get with it. But he, he was that way. He just, you know, very strong, strong work ethic. And a good dose of that is good. You can overdo it with it. But, and he did. <laughs> but a good dose of it is good. I, a lot of folk could use a measure of that. They're too far on the other side. But anyway, he'd tell me this story. And for, for years, little boy, I thought it was true. Later I found out it wasn't, you know. It's a, it was a parable. <laughs> there was this fella that was sorry. Now we're down south. How y'all know sorry? Sorry in the community. Didn't work. Sorry. Lay up. Lazy bum. And he was so sorry. For year after year, and bummed off everybody year after year until the folk of the community decided he was too sorry to live. So they're going to bury him alive. <laughs> Here's a story my grandpa tell me as a little boy. I'm a little guy. I'm thinking, wow. <laughs> they're going to bury him alive. Yeah, bury him alive. Why? He's sorry. Because <laughs> he'd asked me, you know, why? Sorry. Me and my little brother, we knew he's sorry, sorry rascal. Deserved to be buried, you know. After so many years, you know. You. And so they're, they're toting him out of town in the wagon. Of course, you know, this dates him. But in the wagon, they're taking, he's, he's laying in the coffin, you know. They're taking him out of town. And one fellow spoke up and said, you know, where, where y'all taking him, you know? They were burying him. He's sorry, rascal. He he's too sorry to live. He said, well, why? He ain't got enough to, to make it through the winter. He don't have any corn. He don't have any stuff. And he won't plant any. And he won't try to make any. And the guy said, well, I'll, uh, I'll give him some corn. I'll give him enough corn to make it through the winter. They stopped the wagon. You will? Yeah. So the fellow raised up out of the coffin and said, is it shelled? And the man said, no. He said, drive on, boys. <laughs> drive on, boys. <laughs> well, he's sorry. <laughs> Is that right? Your papa didn't tell you stories like that? <laughs> I heard that one probably a thousand times. <laughs> Drive on, boys. Well, this passiveness, this if it, was, if it would fall on me, if somebody bring it to me and put it in, in my hand, well, yeah, I, I'd enjoy it. That doesn't cut it. Those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, what do you say, covet earnestly, the best gifts. You got to have some fire in your belly. You got to have some desire 
for the things of God and be willing. You know, that's one thing that's wrong with a lot of people. They, they, they won't go, they won't get up early enough to go to church. Huh? Just lazy. Just, just you know, not enough fire in them to, to hurry up and get home and clean up and get to the meeting or, or, or to do something or, you know, be, be involved in the part. Well, I just got too much going on and I just like to sit here and share. And, uh, well, life's going to be over in a flash. And the only thing that's going to matter is what we did for people, for the kingdom of God. So we need to be alert and aware. Isn't that what the scripture said? Wake, thou that sleepest. Rise from the dead. Christ will give you light. How many think that the night is far spent? And it's high time that we got with the program, right? And, And do everything we know to do. Be the biggest help and be the biggest blessing that God can use us to be. None of this drive on, boys. <laughs> Proverbs 4, are you there? Wisdom, verse 7, is the principal thing. Therefore, what? Get wisdom. Now, see, that's the third time he said that. Get it. Get it. Get wisdom, and with all your getting... Do what? Get. Get Get it. Get it. Turn your neighbor and say that. Get Get it. Get get what? Get wisdom. Get understanding. Now, do you understand from that that you can just be real passive and it'll probably fall on you one of these days maybe? No. No? No? What do you understand? Like the woman with the issue of blood. You remember her? Who got healed. She didn't get her healing. Laying in the house. Singing Kumbaya. (laughs) I wish somebody would notice me. And come by and touch me. Please Jesus. If it's your will. No. In her weakened condition. I mean she's been through everything. She's weak. She's been hemorrhaging for years and years. In her weakened condition. She got out. She found Jesus. She found the crowd. And he looked like it was impossible to get to him. But she just would not take, you know, lay down and die with this thing. She pressed. Oh, hallelujah. That's a message, isn't it? She pressed through the crowd. She kept saying, if I just touch the hem of his clothes, I will be made whole. If I just touch, when I touch, when I touch. And she pressed through. How many know it took some doing? In a crowd like that, in a weakened condition. She traveled, she got there, she pressed, she reached through, and she got it. She got it. Say it out loud again, get it. Get it. See, that's what faith is. Faith is a receiver. Believe that you receive. And actually, how many remember Mark eleven twenty four? What Jesus said, what things soever you desire. Remember that? When you pray, do what? Believe Believe that God is good. No, No, you need to believe that, but that's not what that said. Believe it is His will for you to be blessed and healed. No, No. Mm -mm. that's that's not believing what He said here. Believe what? Believe He can do it. Believe He's able. No, No, it's not what it said. What did it say? We got it up there? Believe what? What must you believe? Believe that you receive them. See, people are believing all kind of stuff instead of that. Well, I believe God's good. That's great. But that won't, that's not enough. I believe, God, I believe it's God's will. I believe God wants me to have it. Wonderful. But that's not enough. Right? What must you believe? Now, if you look this up, if you look it up, You'll find in vines and strongs and different places that the original meaning of this word, believe that you receive them, is take. T-A-K-E. It's translated that way in other portions and passages. So believe what? Believe that you receive them or believe that you take them. Isn't that what that woman did? Think about it. Jesus wasn't having a meeting. He wasn't teaching. He wasn't preaching. He wasn't having a healing line. Right? She didn't even ask him if it'd be okay for her to get a healing. Isn't it good she wasn't confused that it might not be God's will for her to be healed? She didn't ask anybody. 
She didn't check with any schools of theology or write in any letters or questions. She just pressed in and took it. (laughs) And the Bible said immediately she felt in her body that she was healed and made whole of that thing. See, now the the, the feeling was the last thing that happened. Did you see that? See, people are trying to feel first. It doesn't work that way. Feeling is the last thing. The believing you receive, the believing you take happens first. That's why she backed up in the crowd and is smiling like the cat that got the canary, you know. She's thinking, oh, glory to God. Ooh, I could feel it. I know I'm healed. I know more trips to the doctors night and day and nobody can help me and spending all my money. I'm healed. Glory to God, I'm healed. And she opened her eyes and Jesus had not moved from the spot where she had touched him. Uh Uh-oh. And he's asking, who touched me? Uh Uh-oh, uh-oh. Because she didn't even ask if it was okay to get healed today. The Bible said she was scared. Remember that? And and she didn't come forward right away. Because the Bible said in Luke that he looked around and they all denied. So initially who looked at her? Who touched me, he's saying. Who touched me? And finally, you know, he kept on doing it so long that the disciples said, Master, a lot of people touched you. He said, no, somebody touched me. He wouldn't move. Amen. And he looked around, who touched me? And people are going, oh, no. <laughs> who touched me? He's looking, who touched me? And he looked at her and she's like. <laughs> finally, he wouldn't go on. So she came and fell before him, you remember that, and told him all the truth and what she did and what he say. You should have asked. Because it might not have been, you know, it's not always the will of God. Then why do millions of Christians believe that junk? Hmm? Millions of Christians believe what I, you laughed at it, but millions of Christians believe that. Why? Well, it's easier to believe than the truth as far as a responsibility on us. People like to say, well, no matter what happens or doesn't happen, it's not our fault. We don't know. No, it's easy to be lazy spiritually and just say whatever will be, will be. But it takes some gumption and it takes some desire and it takes some fire when you don't feel like raising your head up off the pillow to get up out of bed, find out where they're at, chase them down the highway. Push your way through a thousand people, right? And reach in there and get it. Oh, come on now, come on. Do I have any getters in here? Getters. Getters. Go getters. What do go getters do? They go get it. And they don't come back empty handed, they come back with something. They come back with what they went to get. Now, why did I say all that? You and I have instructions from the Word of God. We are told to get something. And you can see there's a play on the Word there, isn't it? Get wisdom. Get understanding. Wisdom is the principal thing. So get it. And with all you're getting, get understanding. Get, get, getting. There's a play and emphasis on the words. So say it out loud. I'm getting it. I'm getting my wisdom. I'm getting my understanding. I'm getting it. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We talked earlier about the beginnings, actually, of describing how to become wiser, how to get your wisdom. And one thing we've said is, we've already been emphasizing it, desire. You must love wisdom. You must desire it. You must reach for it, hunger for it, seek for wisdom. And James talks about this. You remember that? He said, if any of you lack wisdom, do what? Let him ask of God, which gives liberally, liberally to all men and upbraideth not, and it shall be given to him. When you're facing a situation, is it okay to ask for wisdom for that situation? So do it without fail. Do it. Look for wisdom in the morning. 
You get up, start looking for the wisdom of God how to handle your affairs. Every time you come, don't, don't just, you know, do something first thing off the top of your head. And don't let the enemy try to pressure you into choosing between one or two or three wrong choices. Well, you got to do this or you got to do that. How do you know? All you see is choice A or B, but God will show you C, D, E, and F, right? There's wisdom of God. How many remember they had Jesus cornered, right? And they said, you know, this woman was taken in the very act of adultery. The, the law said stoner, but what do you say? Well, see, they, they think they got him, don't they? A, stoner, B, don't stoner. If you stoner then you're as mean as they are, and you go, you know, people are gonna gonna see that. Or if you say don't stone her, well, he's against the law. How could he be right? Contradicting the law. And see, the enemy's pressuring him. The Bible talks about they stood around him and they kept on asking him, What about it? What about it? You know all the answers. What about it? And what did he do? Stooped down. Started writing. I believe he's waiting on the wisdom of God. I believe he's looking to the Father. Waiting. And it came up in him. I believe he got a big smile and he thought, "Uh (laughs) uh-huh. And he stood up. He said, the one that's without sin among you, let them throw the first rock. And he bent back down and started writing. Man, in a split second, this thing has turned around. And now all the people are looking at them like, you better not throw a rock. (laughs) I know what you did last week. <laughs> Sorry, rascal. And one by one, they all convicted and condemned by their own conscience. They left. Right? How quickly the whole thing. T- See, the devil thought he had it tied up. But the devil is dumb beside of the wisdom of God. He thinks he knows some stuff, but he doesn't know anything beside the wisdom of God. So the next time you get in a situation and you feel stumped, Do not feel like you have to choose between what's in front of you. Look, check, check for the wisdom. Ask for the wisdom. Look for the wisdom. Can you say amen? Amen. And get your wisdom for that day, for that situation. Get it. Get it. Now, another thing that we're going to talk about today. In fact, go to the first chapter of Proverbs. How many in a rush tonight? You got time? Can we we take our time on this? I'll be honest and frank with you. This is the first time I've ever taught this like this. So I'm having to take my time and see which way to go and, and be led like always. But you know, if you've done something before, then you have more reference. But I am enjoying it. I think I'd teach it just for myself. Because I'm interested. Right? The wisdom of God just makes things so much simpler and easier. I mean... Uh, One of the biggest sources of stress and frustration is not knowing what to do. That's one of the biggest causes of people stressing and worrying and fretting. And when you know what to do, there's no need to stay up the rest of the night. Huh? No need to get an ulcer and pull your hair. When you you know what to do, you just breathe a sigh of relief and you go, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. No more laboring. Well, what if I do this? And what if that don't happen? And and what if? And and what if they don't? And you can live your whole life in what if. And it's an awful place. What if is a bad place to live. The wisdom of God is not what ifs. The wisdom of God is do this. (laughs) Do this. Yeah, but no buts. Just if you got faith, you've heard from God. Now do it. Right? He knows the future. He knows things you don't know. So come out of the land of what if and move into the wisdom of God. Proverbs 1, are you there? Verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction. Now say that word out loud. Instruction. You're going to hear that a lot tonight because this is big, big key 
to receiving your wisdom and getting more wisdom. To know wisdom and instruction to perceive the words of understanding. To receive, well, okay, got to review a little bit. Let me review just a bit for what wisdom is. Wisdom, we said the, the root word means skillful. Skillful. Knowledge is knowing something. You can have a lot of knowledge and not have understanding or wisdom. Knowledge. Simply know You can know a lot of statistics, a lot of facts. That doesn't make you wise. And understanding. We've got three things we're talking about now. Knowledge is just knowing something. Understanding is discernment or seeing into something. I mean, like the engine under your hood. You may know it's there. (laughs) You may know what it does. But do you understand how it does it? Some people do here. A lot of people don't. Right? They know there's a lot of parts that move around in there. (laughs) But if some of those parts are not working right, who should you be looking for now? Somebody who knows about engines or somebody who understands? Somebody who can quote you all the different engines that are in cars and the stats on them and the numbers. You know, the the Lord pointed this out to me as a teenager. That uh, me and some of the rest of the guys used to gripe about algebra and geometry and about having to remember stuff for tests. All those numbers. And then we'd get to study hall. And we could remember the compression ratios for Hemi's and Cobra Jet Fords and and the rear end differential ratio. We'd rattle off numbers for two hours sitting there talking. (laughs) But we couldn't remember the stuff on geometry and, and algebra. I learned a valuable lesson. You remember what's important to you. Now, that'll tell you when somebody tells you what they forgot. Oh, I would have done that, but I just forgot it. You just got through telling us it wasn't important to you. Did you hear me? Because if it's important, it sticks with you. You remember, it makes an impression on you. You remember what's important to you. Understanding is insight into something. You don't just know it's there. You understand why it's there. And what it does, you understand how it does what it does. Right? By the way, somebody asked me, they said, well, Brother Keith, you didn't finish your story about going to school last week. Did you finish? (laughs) Well, yeah. (laughs) I told the story about the first type rating I got on a jet. And I went back and looked at the numbers. I think I exaggerated a little bit. I said 300 something. It was 400. Right at 400. So, sorry. But that's still very, very, very low. And what happened is as I uh, was getting into that, it was brand new to me. I had to believe I could learn it. And I had to believe we talked about faith and learning and understanding. And the Lord helped me. And he helps all of us. But you can't believe you're dumb and you can't talk about how your memory's fading. Right? Right? Can you learn anything you need to or want to learn? Can you? What's age got to do with it? Young or old? Or in between? What if you didn't do so hot when you were in school? Means not a thing. Now you're a child of God. You got the Spirit of God on you who makes you of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. Right? But you got to, one of the things that they do with us in school, I was in school week four last on some of these things, and uh, uh, they're not content. You, you, you'd think it was a mechanic school, some of these pilot things, because it's not enough to just show you this governs this. They actually put one, I was the only student in the class this time. No. Well, guess who answers the questions? <laughs> Every time. Well, it's good for me. 
But what they do, you know, they teach on, we teach on a, a fuel system for two hours. And you talk, they want you to understand when you flip a switch, what happens. It's not enough to just go, well, it runs. <laughs> no, they want to know where that fuel came from and what valve it went through and why it went through there. And if the electricity fails, does it fail open? Does it fail closed? Where's the circuit breakers on it? Which one do you pull when? Wow. On and on and on. Wow. Big fun, yeah. But if you was riding with me and something happened, you'd be glad that I knew, right? You, you'd want me or whoever your pilot is to understand. Not just know that it's back there, but what? Amen. Understand what's happening when you do that. <laughs> Not like Phyllis. <laughs> the first airplane we flew in. <laughs> oh, she's shaking her head. First, we were both of us just as green as could be. We're flying along. I mean, this, we're really, really green. And she looks up, there's a switch right there. She reached up and flipped it and said, what does that do? <laughs> I said, no, no. <laughs> no. Well, you know, you can understand something by doing it and then finding out what it does. <laughs> Which she likes to do, and she doesn't like reading the manual. She said, you read it and tell me what it says. <laughs> but we're talking about the difference between knowledge and what? understanding, knowing why it does it and how it does it. But then what's the third one here that we're talking about? Wisdom. What is Wisdom is not knowledge. You know, people got it all mixed up. They go to school and get three degrees and go, man, he's wise. He could be a fool with, with 12 degrees. Did you hear me? Nothing against education now. Knowledge is good, especially knowledge of good. There's a lot of knowledge of evil you don't want. There's knowledge about a lot of stuff you far better off never knowing about. No. But just because you have knowledge doesn't mean you have wisdom. You, got, you want knowledge, then you want understanding of the knowledge. And then wisdom is knowing how to use. Being skillful at using your knowledge and your wisdom. Knowing when and where and how to use it and what to do with it. And that does not come out of a book. Amen. Wisdom does not come out of a book. Now, God ministers it to us through His words in His book, but still it doesn't come from a book. The Bible talks about it comes out of Him. Yeah. And it comes through our spirit. And it's revelation, not something you figure out. If you walk with God for any length of time and hungered for this, you've seen it. That, you know, you're see, you ask God, Lord, give me wisdom on this thing. And another way of saying it, show me what to do. Show me how to do it. Maybe you know what's going on. You know what could be done. You might have some understanding. But the skill to know how to use this knowledge and understanding for this situation right now, that's where the wisdom of God comes in. And how many have ever received wisdom that you're in this case and all at once, you didn't figure it out, you just know what to do. Yeah. Oh, come on, have you, have you experienced this? Yeah. You, ju you just know what to do and you know that's smarter than me. Right. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Oh, man, that is the thing to do. Right. That's it, that's going to fix this, that's going to straighten this thing. That is the wisdom of God. Amen. Doesn't come by you straining your brain. doesn't come by straining your brain. It's revelation. It comes up in you. Are you hungry for more of this? Yes. Wisdom of God. The wisdom, of, you could call uh, other names for the wisdom of God. The direction of God. The leading of God. The revelation of the plan of God. Right? All of these are manifestations of the wisdom of God. I felt like we needed to review that a little bit for those who were not with us. Come back now to the text. Verse 2. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of what? Understanding. Verse 3, to receive what? There it is again, the instruction of wisdom. Now here we're seeing a vehicle whereby God ministers wisdom to us. The vehicle is what? Instruction. Instruction. 
Did you, if you go back and look through the four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, those that, are, that have read and, and read it very much, thought about it, what's some of the main things Jesus did? If you want to look at the percentage of time that he spent on things, what would be the biggest things he spent his time doing in ministry? Number one, teaching. Is that right? The Bible said more than once he went around teaching, preaching, healing. You see that repeatedly. But again and again, sometimes it says teaching when it didn't say the others. Teaching, teaching, instructing. And so much of the uh, gospel accounts we have are portions and passages of his instruction. Like all the parables. Instruction must have been important. Right? Right? If something else was more important, he would have done that more. Right? So what should we emphasize now? Well, that's one reason that our services have so much of it in them. Right? That's not all the service is supposed to be, but we're supposed to have a lot of it. And it's not just supposed to be something coming out of men and women's heads. It's supposed to be anointed. Revelation. Instruction from the Holy Spirit. Not just man to man. But God to man. Amen. Right? Yes. Said out loud, Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Anointed. Anointed. Instruction. Instruction. Is it vital to us? Yes. Oh, thank God. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. To give subtlety or discretion to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will do what? Yes. Will hear... And will increase learning. A wise man will do what? How about a fool? A fool won't hear. Doesn't want to hear. Wonders what in the world you come here on a good Friday night and sit up in here with your Bible. When you could be out getting drunk or something. Having fun. Now, is that right how some people think? Because they, they don't see the value of instruction and hadn't got time for it. That's a fool. Now, we're beginning to see it, but you're going to see it over and over and over through these passages. A wise man wants to hear and wants to know. A fool hadn't got time for it. Don't bother me with it. Right? A fool says, boring, boring, boring. I got to party. (laughs) And fools wind up dead at an early age. And fools lose their relationships and lose their careers and, right, lose their families. I hope I'm not looking at any fools in this place tonight or through the camera. Say it out loud, no fools here. No fools here. No, no fools here. (laughs) Just wise people. Well, what do wise people want to do? They, they want to hear. They want to learn. They want to be instructed. We're going to see something else as we go, but this is good enough for now. He said, a man of understanding will attain unto wise counsels. See, the first step is knowledge. You find out something. Then you begin to understand what you found out. It's not just stats and numbers and facts. You begin to understand what you're talking about, and then you develop skill in using your knowledge and your understanding how to apply it in life situations. And the more of it you have, the easier life is for you, and the better it is for you. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings, they're, they're dark to the ignorant and to the foolish. In verse 8, <clears throat> well, no, let's see, for time's sake, skip down to verse uh, 20. Verse 20. Wisdom cries without, she utters her voice in the streets. She cries in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates. In the city, she utters her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones? Other translations say, You silly, gullible ones. (laughs) Silly and gullible. 
How long will you love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Fools hate what? They don't want to hear. They don't want to learn. They don't want to know. Verse 23. Turn you at my reproof. Now here he's talking about something else besides instruction. What is this? I'm going to give you three keys. and I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. I know this is a little different. We're not, we're not preaching fast and running the aisles tonight. But this is important too. How many of you don't need to eat potato chips and ice cream all the time? Sometimes you need cornbread and turnip greens. Huh? You need something to stick to your ribs, right? You need need something to help you. And sometimes it might be a food you don't particularly like. But you need it. Your body needs it. I know. When Phyllis and I first started dating, I went to her house. And her mom is Cajun. And I had never eaten crawfish. I had never eaten crab. And I was surprised by it. I thought, what is this doing on the table, you know? <laughs> now some of my favorite food. But then it was very strange to me. Also, they ate cauliflower and uh, Brussels sprouts. Now, when I put a Brussels sprout in my mouth for the first time... I thought that had to be the awfulest thing I have ever put in my mouth. I thought, golly. And so I dared not touch one for the next 10 years. We didn't eat them at at my house. I I never ate them. But after learning some things in God and beginning to grow some, I realized that there there was some, you know, dark green vegetables have some things for you. Nutritionally that you need. And I begin to say, if it's good for me, I like it. Did you get that now? How many of us childish to go, ooh, yuck, I don't eat that? Hmm? It'd be like premium gasoline smelling the the nozzle and go, ooh, I don't I'm not putting that in my car, no. I like cherry Kool-Aid. smells good it tastes good I'm putting cherry Kool-Aid in my car (laughs) well you ain't riding either because your car won't run on cherry (laughs) Kool-Aid so I I begin to see that that is childish to talk about ooh I don't like that ooh I'm not going to eat it no this body is my temple and the temple of the Holy Ghost I'm the caretaker of it and if something would be good for it I ought to do it Whether I think I like it or not is really beside the point. Now, it's not to a lot of people, but it should be. So I begin to say, if it's good for me, I like it. If it's good for me, I like it. And so I was around some of these Brussels sprouts, and I decided, I think I ought to eat one. So I ate one. Oh, brother. (laughs) I thought, why did I do that? So... But it came up again, and I ate another one. And I'd say in between grimaces, if it's good for me, mm, I like it. It's a faith statement. I actually like them now. I do. I'll eat them when there's other stuff to eat. I'll go to them on purpose again. I like them. (laughs) Or some folks say, well, good for you, but I ain't eating them. (laughs) Well, whatever it is, If the Lord deals with you to do something, have enough maturity to not be led by your feelings or your flesh preferences. Do what is good and right for you and believe, can can your tastes change? Can your feelings change? Can your desires change? Yes, they can. Spiritual people are not governed and dominated by their feelings and their desires and their wants. Or dislikes. If something needs to change, they put their faith on it and say, no, buddy, you come into line here. You change. Taste change. Appetites change. Feelings change. And it may not change in a week or two or a month or two, but you just stay after it until it changes. And it will. (laughs) There's some guys saying, I wish you hadn't said that, Brother Keith, because... (laughs) 
Yeah, you do. You're glad about it. Talk faith. Proverbs 1, let's continue. He said, turn you at my what? Reproof. Now, he's already mentioned instruction. Now, he mentions something else. We're going to see this again and again. Reproof. And like I said, I'm going to get ahead a little bit here and give you a third thing. You're going to see this. Rebuke. Say it out loud. Instruction. Instruction. Reproof. Reproof. Now, another way of saying reprove is to say correct. So reprove and correct are very close. But then this last one is stronger than reprove or correct. Rebuke. Rebuke. If you want wisdom, you've got to be interested in these. You've got to be interested in them, and you've got to be open to them, and you must receive instruction and reproof and correction, and if need be, rebuke. A wise man appreciates these. A fool despises them. Now you're going to see this as we go. Do you want to be a fool or a wise person? Then you must not let yourself despise instruction or correction or rebuke. You must not. You must learn to appreciate it. People see correction as a negative thing. Don't they? So many do. They see if I had, well, I had to be corrected. Hmm, hurt my feelings. They've had to correct me three times this month. I'm tired of it. Tired of being corrected. (laughs) You know how we know about some of these things? Both in our own personal life and in dealing with other people. I know. Human nature is such that most people do not value, they do not appreciate correction, particularly rebuke, which is strong. Now, with this in mind, go with me to, uh, hold your place here, and go to Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. Let me remind you what the Lord said about correction. You know it, let's look at it again. Hebrews. The twelfth chapter. We're coming back to Proverbs, but we should look at this. Hebrews 12, I'm going to begin reading in verse 5, Hebrews 12, 5, and I have the living uh, translation here. <coughs> Hebrews 12, 5. This says, Have you quite forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you, his child? He said, my son, don't be angry when the Lord punishes you. What's the King James say? Chastens. And this has to do with with strong correction. It includes the idea of correction, reproof, and rebuke. Don't be discouraged when he has to show you where you are wrong. Isn't that what correction is about? What what is correction? One definition I found of correction is to alter or adjust to bring to the right condition. If it's wrong, it needs to be corrected. Right? Why should we take it so personal and get our feelings hurt so much if something needs to be corrected? Why would you have to take it personally? In, in a hurtful way. Well, they had to correct me. Why would anybody be surprised that you needed to be corrected? Now, let's stop and think about it now. If you never need any instruction or any correction, what does that mean? What would that imply? That you already know everything and have everything perfect and right in your life. Could that be true about anybody sitting here tonight? That you already know everything that you need to know and you're already right about everything that you know or think or that you're doing. That ain't right. So since that's not true, what should you have 
regularly. Some instruction and some correction. Can you see how we've not thought right about this? We've not thought right about this as a society in general. People look at it as, you know, they feel like they ought to be able to go 30 years and nobody ever correct them. I'm an adult. Well, I'll correct myself. If you don't know it, how are you going to correct yourself? If you didn't even know you were wrong about it, how are you going to correct yourself? Well, just me and Jesus. He's the only one that correct me, can correct me. Well, that's convenient. <laughs> How would anybody except you and Jesus know? Well, you can't. Only me and Jesus can know. <laughs> These are the folks that are the most messed up of all. Did you know that's part of the ministry's job? Thank you for those three (laughs) amens. Okay, hold your place. Go to to Timothy, 2 Timothy. (laughs) 2 Timothy. Two things here that I want you to notice. First of all, 2 Timothy, the third chapter, 2 Timothy 3 and 15. 2 Timothy 3, 15, he says, You know that from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you what? Wise. Wise. Now, now notice how it comes. Though. So we're back to the, the vehicle of it. God uses the Holy Scriptures. And it's an indication already of what kind of person you are, because you are sitting here tonight with this book in your hand, instead of somewhere else doing something else. That's already an indication that you are wiser than the average bear. (laughs) On the outside, you know what I'm saying? Because you're in here. We're in here. The Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now, how many understand the the dumbest thing, the the biggest fool is the one that loses their own soul? So, So the ultimate application of wisdom is realizing that there is the one true living God. And his son is Jesus. And he is virgin born and raised from the dead. And did pay the price right. And receive and believe on him. And be born again. And serve him in this life. And have reward in the next. And have a place in his kingdom in eternity. That's wise. The fool says there is no God. That's the biggest fool on the planet. Right? I don't care how many schools they went to, how many books in the library, they are fool, capital F-O-O-L, fool. Somebody say, not me. Amen. He said, able to make you wise to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 16, all Scripture. Now stop right here. Did he change subjects or is this is a flow of the first thought here? Is he talking about wisdom? Wisdom and Scripture. And all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, that's teaching, or you could say instruction. Right? Here's instruction. And for what else? Do we need something besides instruction at times? What else do we need? Reproof. For reproof, for correction. Do we need, besides instruction, do we need reproval and correction? Yes, Yes, we do. Not a one of us that doesn't. For instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. The, The Holy Scriptures 
able to make us wise unto salvation. And through the Scriptures, the, the Scriptures are, are profitable, beneficial for all these things. Right? Look at it one more time. For what things? For doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction. Now back up to the second chapter. The second chapter, I'm not quite ready for that one. Before you read that one, I stopped reading too, too quick here. Go back to that third chapter, verse 15. 3.15, 2 Timothy 3.15. From a child you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing in His kingdom, preach the word. Now, do you see the connection? This wasn't written in chapter and verse. It was divided for reference sake. Because the Scriptures make us wise, because they are useful for instruction and, and correction and reproof, then he said, you preach them. You proclaim them, and you do it when you feel like it and when you don't. When it's handy and when it's not. When it's popular and in season... And when it is not. Right? And what else do you do? He didn't stop there. What else do you do? Is this talking to, to ministers and preachers now? Preach, we know ministers are supposed to preach the word. But a lot of them cross the line. And reprove too. Uh oh. No. It's in the same verse. It's just a scriptural to reprove and rebuke. Which is a very strong word. As it is to preach the word. Right? Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound teaching. I think it's come in a lot of places where people are not even open to receiving correction or rebuke. No, no, no. You just tell me what you think, and I'll decide what I want to do with it. Who are you to correct me? Are you trying to correct me? They'll heap to themselves teachers having what? Now, what's the deal with an itching ear? Something itches, what you want to do with it? So what does that mean? That's somebody that will tell you what you want to hear. And it is so sad that so many churches, the ministers have no authority. They are hirelings. They are hired and fired at whim and will of the board. Right? Totally unscriptural. Totally wrong. And so because of that, they always have in mind staying popular That's right. so I can get voted in for another term. If I preach something they don't like or if I do something they don't like or if I correct, you know, deacon so-and-so and he gets mad, well, I'm probably out of here. So there's come so much politics in church entity. And because of that, minister, you know, so many people don't even know what a real pastor is. They don't even know. You know, we, over the years, we, we've been here, what, three years now. And we had a few people that were surprised. <laughs> that we, you know, we didn't just sit on the sideline. That we were involved. And if we didn't like something, we said so. Are you with me now? 
And the Lord told me when we first started this thing, He said, uh, I mean, this was like the second week of the church. He said, if you're always giving in to people, who's leading this place? I said, well, it wouldn't be me. If I'm always giving in to somebody else, I wouldn't be leading. He said, if I wanted somebody else leading it, I would have put them here. And you'll have to stand before me and give an account of why you let something happen or why you didn't do something. And it's not going to hold water for me to stand up there going, well, Lord, you know, the people didn't like it. And in Branson, they didn't think that way. And you know, so-and-so, if I'd have said, they'd have got mad and half the church might have left. You'd be a lot better off with half the church leaving than standing up before the Lord. Right? Getting judged for not doing what you're supposed to do. Now, people, people get out of the ditch on that side and come all the way across the ditch and abuse their position. Hmm? And are just mean and harsh and hard and nosy. Hmm? It's none of my business whether you buy a Chevy or a Ford. Right? And how your wife dresses, unless she's distracting the service. I mean, what I mean by less, less half the men are not looking to the platform. Then it becomes my business. But, you know, what kind of tie you wear, what style house you build. You know, I believe in people learning to be led of the Lord for their self. Being trained and being led. But particularly where spiritual things are concerned. The pastors are supposed to be the spiritual mom and daddy. And the kids are not supposed to run the house. Did you hear me? And in so many churches, people don't have a concept of this at all. You can hear it the way they talk. Y'all need to come hear our little preacher. He's a good little preacher. We just hired him last month. <laughs> and he's got no authority. And he's got to watch everything he says if he wants to stay out the year. <laughs> Aren't you glad we're free from that around here? I hope you are. <laughs> Somebody said, why are you saying all that? Because in order to be wise, you must have something besides instruction. What else must you have? Some correction. Right? And if needed, even some rebuke. Now, rebuke is tough. Rebuke is not even necessarily in a kind tone. Rebuke can, can seem harsh and hard. But sometimes, depending on the severity of the situation, how many know if you're about to run your car off a cliff? You, you don't necessarily want somebody. Now, you might think you did at the time, but when it's all said and done, you don't want them on the side of the road going, Honey, <laughs> please. No, I'm, I, you need something that will jar you if you're about to be destroyed. Right? Did Je and Now, we've been reading, you know, in the Bible, the gospel accounts. Did Jesus ever correct people? Did he ever rebuke people? Was he stern with them sometimes? Was he being mean and just hard and cruel? Was he having a bad day? No, no. What was he doing? It was necessary. It was needful because they weren't getting it the normal channels. They weren't paying attention. Something needed to jar on. And so these are aspects of ministry. <laughs> Getting some looks across the crowd. They're like, what are you planning on doing? The Bible. <laughs> Same thing we've been planning on doing ever since we've been here. Right? Now, I'm a strong believer in not embarrassing anybody, you know, publicly. Uh, unless the Lord really deals with you to do it that way. So I think a whole, and we've practiced this, a whole lot of the correction uh, could be done privately. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, and, and where people are, for lack of a better phrase, can save face. and No need to humiliate anybody, embarrass anybody. Now, there are times, Jesus did it, where hypocrites were rebuked publicly. But that's not common. And again, it's people that were hypocritical. And it needed to be dealt with that way. <clears throat> but here he says part of the ministry in preaching the word is also reproving, 
rebuking, exhorting, with long-suffering and doctrine. Go back to Proverbs. Let me see if I can tie this up for this evening a little bit. Do you want to be wise? Yes. <laughs> then what? what? What do you got to receive? Instruction and reproof or correction and even can you? Can you take it? While you're turning back to Proverbs, let me finish reading uh, Hebrews to you. We didn't finish, but I'll read it while you're finding your place there. I think I will. It was in the living, right? I have many notes. There we go. He said, have you forgotten the, the encouraging words? Don't be angry when the Lord punishes you. Don't be discouraged when he has to show you where you're wrong. For if he chastens you, if he corrects you, it proves that he loves you. Amen. How many believe that? Yes, Whom he loves, he chastens, he corrects. Now, this is not just instruction. How many understand the difference between instruction and correction? You're being corrected. Somebody's telling you, no, that's not right. That's wrong. This is right. Should you just automatically get your feelings hurt if that happens? Should it be a strange thing that that happens to you? No. no. That should be happening all along with all of us. Right? That we're shown this is not right, this is wrong. You thought this was right, but it's not. This is, this is right. Correction. It says, it proves that you're really his child. Let God train you, for he's doing what any loving father does for his children. Who ever heard of a son who was never corrected? Well, that's what we're saying. If God doesn't correct you, chasten you, punish you when you need it, as other fathers chasten their sons, it means you're not really God's son at all, and you don't belong in the family. Since we respect our fathers here on earth, though they punish and correct us, should we not all the more cheerfully submit to God's training so we can begin really to live? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I didn't see this when we first started on it, but I now begin to see some where we're going. The Lord told me this some years ago. I wrote it down. Let me share it with you. He said to me, Keith, the thing that might, that, that would challenge you, aggravate you, maybe anger you the most, if you would receive it and deal with it, would be the thing that would cause you to grow the biggest Amen. and the quickest. How many know there are areas where people get touchy? Husbands and wives get touchy with each other about an area and they, they come to find out, we can't talk about that. Just because you don't talk about it doesn't make it all right. And does not make it go away. And these things don't just evaporate because of time. It takes humility and it takes faith to be able to look the thing in the eye and even if it's ugly and it's me, be a man, be a woman, step up, look it in the eye and judge it. Go, yeah, I've been like that and it ain't right. I've been like that for 20 years. I've been like that for 40 years and it ain't right. But then don't just stop there and be condemned. Have enough faith, right, to believe I can overcome. Amen. I can be like Jesus in this area. Amen. I can change. Amen. But if you're so touchy, if you're so sensitive that you can't receive any instruction and correction, much less a rebuke about it, then you will not get past it. You will not get beyond it. Have you seen people get so touchy? 
about their weight. Oh, don't bring up my weight. That is off limits. <laughs> and you're in bondage. And you're going to stay there. How many understand there is wisdom from God how to get off that excess? I said, oh, you done going to meddling now, Brother Keith. I ain't running for anything. There's not going to be an election, no vote. I care about you being happy, having victory. Life's too short to have something kick you and defeat you decade after decade like there's no power in God to overcome it. How many believe there is wisdom in God no matter what you've been dealing with, how long this thing's been defeating you, there's wisdom in God and grace in God to win it, to overcome it. But you can't be touchy about it or else you will not receive your instruction and your correction. Can't be touchy about your money, about your financial problems. There's, they're folk that are so touchy. They, they, their finances are in such a mess. They're behind. They owe everybody. Everything is such a mess. Oh, but don't you bring it up. Ooh, no, no. That's my business. Well, your business is messed up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's my messed up business. Well, yeah. <laughs> and depending on how long you want it to stay messed up, you got to get over being touchy. Right? As long as you are touchy and will not receive instruction and correction, you're being a fool in that area because fools despise instruction. Let's read some more scriptures along this line. Proverbs. Can you take some more? I'd like to, I know, I know it's getting a little bit later, but not really for a Friday night, you know. <laughs> Only got two amens on that. It's like, well, it's kind of late. Hey, if you could get something that could help you change something that's been eating your lunch for 20 years, it would be worth another three hours, right? I mean, yeah. Instead of waking up in the morning, no closer to the answer than you were this morning or yesterday. Are you there in Proverbs? Let's finish reading this. One, we stopped in one. Verse 23, turn at my reproof. Behold, I'll pour out my spirit to you. I'll make known my words to you. Now let's back up. If you do what? You, you got to turn means to change. Turn around. That's repentance. At my reproof. Because I called and you what? Refused. I stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But you have said it not, my counsel. You would none of my reproof. He said you wouldn't have it. You wouldn't hear it. Friends, don't turn me off now. Can you stay with me for another few minutes? There are people sitting in here right now, people watching by the internet, and you have, you've done that. In your marriage, you, there are stuff you, you, you have, you've dared your spouse don't, don't you even talk to me about that. And you, refru you refused reproof. You would have none of it. Don't, don't try to correct me. There are people that's been in and out of churches, and they've been in three different churches over the past several years where their ministers tried to talk to them about that, and they would not hear it. And so they just, they just changed churches. And uh, nobody talks to me about that. Notice what it goes on to say. You've said it not, all wisdom's counsel. You would none of wisdom's reproof. What's going to happen to him? He said, I'm going to laugh at your calamity. And mock when your fear comes. When your fear comes as desolation. Your destruction comes like a whirlwind. Distress and anguish comes on you. Now let's just stop right here. See, this is what people don't see. They see people in terrible turmoil and how bad it is, but they didn't see when God tried to talk to them about it 30 years ago. Did you hear me? And tried to talk to them again and sent people and sent people and they would not have it. Don't talk to me about that. 
Well, this destruction will come. Yes, it will. He said, verse uh, 28, Then they'll call me, but I won't answer. They'll seek me early. Well, then, but they won't find me then. For why? Verse 29. For that they hated knowledge, and they did not choose the fear of the Lord. I, they would none of my counsel. They despised what? All my reproof. They despised it. See, a wise man, I, I, it reminds me of my youth. My dad put me in a school of martial arts when I was 10 years old. And they were old school, concrete floors and no pads. And the instructors, yeah, ouch. And the, instruct, <laughs> the instructors were very, very strict. And man, you, you did not, you know, when you were sitting watching somebody else spar or do something, you did not lean up against the wall. You did not lean up against other, each other. You crossed your legs a certain way. You sat erect. And... Uh, you know, you responded correctly. A lot of discipline, almost military. And it's good. It helped me. I, I think it's great. But the instructor would come by, and maybe your stance is not right. And so he'd come by, and he'd, he'd, you know, he'd move you, and he'd go, you know, bark at you, sometimes in Japanese, you know. And, and, and so then, you, you know, you try to make it right. Now, if he did that about three times, the next thing you'd feel is you bouncing off the concrete floor. They'd just come and sweep you and boom. Now what you're supposed to do is pop up and say, Thank you, sir. Did you get that? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Why? Because I didn't get it the first three times. And I needed something to help me focus and concentrate better. And my, my instructor is helping me out. Yes. Right? He's showing me the right way to do it. And in time to come, you really are glad because it pays off. How many know we ought to have that mentality? We got that much sense in natural stuff. That's what he's saying in Hebrews. How much more if the Father God corrects you? Yes. Even if it's stern. What should you say? Thank you, Thank you sir. God corrects you through somebody, through your leaders, through your fellow Christian, through somebody else. A wise man, a wise woman sees the value. And instead of getting their feelings hurt and getting touchy and getting miffed, they go, thank you. Thank you for pointing that out to me. Thank you for helping me with that. Thank you. I'm talking about Faith Life Church people now. Wise people who say, thank you. Yeah, thank you. How many times have you seen people in simple stuff? They're doing something wrong, and somebody who's got 20 years experience, and it points it out to them, says, well, you know, you might want to do this and this. And they go, well, I know what I'm doing. That's a fool. Here's somebody who's got 10 times their experience trying to help them out, and they can't take an instruction. That's a fool. A wise person will say, thank you. Anything else? Right? A wise person loves instruction. Loves correction. Right? Loves it. Why? Because the, he or she sees the value of it. They know, man, this could save me all kinds. Save me from tearing up my equipment. Save me from wasting money. Save me from wasting half a day. Right? Save me. Right? Wise person sees the value. Glory to God. Glory to God. Let me read some more to you here. Let me read some more to you. <clears throat> Go to, only, only a couple of more passages, I think. Go to the uh, ninth chapter. I'm just going to turn through, read a couple. Let these be in your thinking. Then you'll be primed when we come back to pick up here next time. Proverbs 9 and 8. What does it say? Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate you. Rebuke, and that's a strong word. 
That's, that's, that's being tough for somebody. Rebuke a wise man and he'll what? What a contrast. How can you tell whether somebody's a fool or a wise person? You see how they take correction. How they take instruction. If you, and, and here's the other side of it. If you can see somebody does not appreciate instruction, should you try to instruct them anyway? No. Mm -mm. Now this is how God is too. Don't cast your pearls before swine. Don't give that which is holy to the dogs. And a lot of people say, well, why didn't God tell me? Because you didn't want to know. You didn't want to hear it. He said, you, you rebuke a wise man, and what will he do? He'll love you. He will love you for rebuking him. I know, uh, are y'all relaxed? I don't like to feel rushed just because there's a few minutes. You know, how many understand all services do not have to be the exact same length? Where is that in the scriptures? The reason I bring it up is because I, I feel it. You get to a certain place and, and, and people say, why do you keep saying it? Because I feel it. People are going, well, Brother Keith, Brother Keith. Would you rather me go by the clock? Or if we feel released. Now, if you're tired, you got to go. That's all right, go. I won't be upset. If you say, that's all I, I got all I want, got all I came for, good. Come back another time. Uh, help me, Lord. I got talking about that. And let that get away from me. Uh, yeah. You rebuke a wise man and what? He'll love you. I, got, I had the opportunity to serve with Brother Hagen, Kenneth Hagen, for 20 some years. And uh, there were times he corrected me. That should not be shocking. A young man, 20 years old, knows very little about God. Here's an elder, 80 years old, multiple visions from the head of the church. Walk with God faithfully for, de you know, 60 some years at that time. Should it be surprising no, sir. that the young man gets some correction? No, sir. Then why would people think it's a strange thing? Or get offended or get hurt? I think I've told you this before, but one that stands out to me, there are a few times I got rebuked. Not too many, thank God. Quite a bit of correction. Tons of instruction. Quite a bit of correction. A little bit over the years of rebuke. One day, we were in a service. I've told you this, but it'll bear repetition. And the, the young lady and myself that were doing singing and playing, uh, you know, we were sitting on the front row, and, and Brother Hagin looked over and said, Y'all come on up, get ready to go. He's talking about sing, close the service out. Well, she looked at me, and she said, You want to sing today? I said, I don't care. You can. She said, Well, I don't care. You can. And we sat there and went back and forth for <laughs> three minutes, maybe, four, five, while he kept talking. Well, he looked over, and he said, from the platform, the whole crowd obviously heard him over the PA system, said, <laughs> room full of people. He said, well, if I'd have known it was going to take you that long, I wouldn't even have called on you. I said, that, that's hard. It was needed. Because we knew better. This wasn't our first day. And what we're doing is being disrespectful to Him, to the things of God, because we're just sitting there lolling around. I mean, we know the, the service closes every time. <laughs> he finishes. We How many know we should have been thinking about this an hour ago? Watching the direction of the service and trying to think what would be good for that and where this would fit and be ready. And so when he called on us, we're ready. So what he said, be instant. The Word of God's able to make you wise, wise people looking ahead, thinking ahead, so then you're instant. I mean, he barked it. If I'd have known it was going to take you that long, I wouldn't have called on you. Somebody said, phew, I don't like that. I wouldn't serve anybody like that. Yeah. And where would you be in ministry? 
I've seen this. In my few years in the ministry, there's been probably a dozen serious times we could have got offended. We could have got our feelings hurt. We could have bailed and missed God. And you and I probably wouldn't be looking at each other tonight. Did you hear me? Because it ain't always fun getting rebuked. And your flesh don't like it. Doesn't, just because your flesh don't like it and it doesn't feel good doesn't mean you don't need it. Right? And even if somebody went overboard and didn't do it exactly the way they should have done it, still doesn't mean you didn't need it. Right? What's it time to do? Pop up and say, Thank you, sir. Right? So people ask me in time after this, why do you jump and run to the platform? Well, that's why. But see, there's reasons you, you, people might think, well, well, man, he's, he's picky. No, if you knew him, you knew it ain't about him at all. It's just experience knowing that if there's a big lull, maybe the Spirit of God gets to moving. And then there's this huge lull uh, in between that and what comes next. You lose the flow. It's serious. It's lack of respect. It's lack of focus. See, it was serious. But people want to say, well, what does it matter? I don't see what's all the big deal. You don't have to. You're the younger. Submit to the elder. Right? I don't understand that. You don't have to understand it. Respect it. You want to be wise? Receive your correction. Take your medicine. Right? Receive your instruction. I got another one. Proverbs 13. Proverbs 13 and 18. What does it say? Poverty and shame shall be to him that what? What if they believe in prosperity? What if they sow seed? See, there's more to prosperity than just confessions and sowing seed. If you're hard-headed and you're not, you're not teachable and you refuse instruction, I don't care if you do believe in prosperity. You will experience poverty and shame. Somebody say, not me. But... He that does what? Regards reproof shall be honored. A person that looks on reproof and goes, oh yeah, that's important. Thank you. I received that. I appreciate you taking the time. Do you understand? If a person's heart is right, they don't enjoy correcting you. Amen. You ever heard your mama say, this hurts me more than it does you. You might not have believed it, but now if you're a mom or daddy, you know what they're talking about. And as, as leaders with Phyllis and myself, we get no pleasure out of having to correct somebody. we got enough going on as it is. And if something comes up, you're thinking, oh, man. Because, <laughs> you know, a lot of people don't enjoy it, don't want to hear it. But if you've got a job to do, you've got a job to do. And so from the other standpoint, a wise person will appreciate an elder or leader going through that for them. Right? I've, there's been times people didn't realize it. I got in. It was late. I was tired. I was looking forward to a day of rest. And I couldn't do it. I had to go in and pray and wait on God sometimes for hours to get wisdom and get clear. And then go get cleaned up and go see them and go talk to them. And they didn't appreciate it at all. All they understand is I'm getting corrected. Didn't see the fact I loved them enough to put my feelings aside. And be willing for them not to like me for a few days. Did you hear me? If it will help them grow up. And miss some problems. There's another side to this isn't there? Skip down to the 15th chapter. And I think, I think this is it for tonight. 15 and 5. A fool does what? 
despises his father's instruction. It ain't okay for your children and your teenagers. And you're trying to tell them something important and them roll their eyes at you and sigh and tolerate you. That is not okay. They are acting like a fool already. And it does not go well for fools in their life. Fools do not have good lives. Right? So as long as, you know, in that situation, you don't tolerate that. You say, hey, you sit there and straighten yourself up. Look at me. We're not playing here. Now, I love you, and this is important. You pay attention. Because so many parents are so sloppy, they just let their kids wallow around and whine and smack their gum. And, oh, mom, oh, please, hey, show some respect. I'm talking to you seriously now. This is not playing. Sit up. Be a, be a young woman. Be a young man. Pay attention to me. Are y'all with me? Don't, don't, don't tolerate all that stuff. You're preparing them for failure if you let all that stuff go. Well, they're just kids. Well, they're just youth. I know. That's why we got such a mess. Because people think that. you Don't, don't you think. Little ones. I mean little ones know stuff that's going on. Oh, they, they can be so much sharper than their parents think they are. They can learn. They can see. 15.5. A fool despises his father's instruction. But he that regards reproof is prudent. Skip down to verse 10. Correction is grievous to him that forsakes the way. And he that hates reproof shall die. There's been people. That I've tried to help. I, and I'm thinking about some people right now, certain individuals, off and on for decades. Try, I don't know how many hours I've prayed for them. And tried to help. And God's done miracles and miracles, but their life has been miserable. It has been hell. And one day I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, <laughs> what because I love them. I don't want to see them like that. Lord, what can be done? He said, they're unteachable. As long as they're that way, nothing. So you're thinking they wouldn't listen to you. He said, they won't listen to me. And if they won't listen to me, I can't help them. I can't fix it. And when he said that, I be, he began to remind me of this time and this time and this time that I had sat and pled with them for two hours. Don't do this. Don't do this. Stay here and do this and focus on that. They wouldn't listen. And then another time and another time. I've sat down with people before and, and, and showed them scriptures for an hour, one-on-one. Scriptures. And they cried and they said, yeah, that's right, Brother Keith. And the next two weeks later, they went straight and did what we said not do. What is that? Unteachable. Do not esteem instruction or correction and that's a fool. And what did it say here? What happened to that person? Died. Last person, they die. They die. Keep reading. Verse 12. A scorner loves not one that reproves him. Neither will he go to the wise. Now you, you see that happen. People will get where they don't want to be around you. Now you ought not be chewing on them. But if they think you're going to talk about something about it, then they try to stay away. Skip down to verse 31. The ear that hears the reproof of life abides among the wise. <laughs> they live with the wise at Faith Life Church <laughs> and other wonderful places. He that refuses instruction despises his own soul. But he that hears reproof gets understanding. 
The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is... And can you see how that flows together now? Is humility, another, a part of humility is being teachable, correctable, teachable. Even if somebody's wrong. There's been times I knew people were wrong from the time they started. But I thought, well, tell me. It won't take but a couple of minutes to listen to them. I mean, know what I'm talking about. I'm teachable. You know, there's, thank God, not too many, but a few times people send you ugly grams. You know what an ugly gram is, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like you ought to get out of the ministry. You're hurting more people than you're helping and all that kind of junk and stuff. Well, I, I'll take it. A lot of times, if there's nothing to look at, I don't look at it. But if there's something that I should, I'll take Even if I think people's got a wrong spirit, I try to see, is there anything there? Am I like that? Am I doing that? And sometimes you might see one thing. And the rest of it, they, they're wrong. They're off. But that thing, yeah, I have been a little bit that way. You always got to have an open ear. Willing to hear. Even if it's not pretty. Willing to look at it. Even if it's not nice. If it's not flattering. Even if somebody's attitude's wrong, their spirit's wrong. Try, what they're trying to do. You still, I still want to know the truth. Right? And if the truth makes me look bad, well, so be it. Because by the grace of God, I can change. Amen. And if it is wrong, I want to see it. Because if it's wrong, that's why some things haven't been working. And as soon as I get it and change it, now I'm going to get results. Amen. Glory to God. So a wise man, a wise woman loves instruction. Yeah, teach me. Yes, yeah, show me. Show me. Even when you think you know. Yes, yeah, show me. I've had people surprised that, you know, and I'm surprised why they don't think that way. But I've been doing some things, and one guy was with me, and he said, well, you let that guy show you that three times. You've been flying uh, five times longer than him. Why'd you do that? Because, how many understand you can go over something a hundred times, and there not be, be something you didn't see? And sometimes people say, they'll say it a different way, or they've learned through experience a nuance, right? Yes, and a, uh, a wise man, a wise woman is a continual student. Yes, Aren't they? Yes, They're always eager to learn, knowing they've got so much to learn. Yes, Open and looking, right? Yes. Willing to be even corrected and rebuked if need be. Right? And the wise receives the reproof and lives and abides among the wise. You know who is the wisest of all is God. That means you're in his company. You, you live with the wise. Hallelujah. Stand on your feet and lift your hands. Begin to praise God for the wisdom of the Holy One. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We value your correction. We love you and value your instruction. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Glory to God. Let's praise him some more. Just lift your hands. Don't be in too big of a hurry. Now, Lord, we thank you. We worship 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 you. Hallelujah. Pray this prayer with me. Father God, I love you. I love your wisdom. I love your instruction. I love your correction. Your reproof, your rebuke is an ornament to me. Your correction is a blessing to me. I thank you for it. Because I know you correct those you love. What I see not, show me please. What I've not understood, reveal to me please. Anything I'm wrong about, correct me please. If needed, rebuke me. I'll receive it. 
I love your correction. I love your truth. I'll receive it by your grace. Thank you for increasing in me your wisdom, your understanding, the knowledge of the holy. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. 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 Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Oh, just close your eyes and lift your hands. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. I will yield myself to the Holy Spirit. I yield myself to the unction of God. I'm going to yield myself, yes I am, to the Holy Spirit. I will let Him be. My God, everybody, I yield myself, I yield myself to the Holy Spirit. I'm gonna yield myself, oh yes, I will, to the unction of God. I'm gonna yield myself, yes, I will, to the Holy Spirit. I'm going to let Him be my guide. I yield myself when He's talking to me. I'm going to yield myself even when He's correcting me. I'm going to yield myself, yes I will, when He's moving on me. I'm going to let Him be my guide. Everybody sing and say, yield myself, oh yes I will, to the Holy Spirit. I'm going to yield myself. Myself to the unction of God. I'm going to yield, yield myself to the Holy Spirit. I'm going to let Him be my God. I'm going to yield myself to the Holy Spirit, I'm going to yield myself, yield myself to the unction of God. I'm going to yield myself, yield myself to the Holy Spirit. I'm going to let Him be my God. I will yield myself when he's he's instructing me I will yield myself when he's correcting me I'm gonna yield myself when he's dealing with me I'm gonna let him be my God, sing it for yourself to Him. I will yield myself to the Holy Spirit. I'm gonna yield, yield myself to the unction of God. I'm gonna yield myself, yield myself to the Holy. I will let you, I will let you be my God. Oh, 
glow on the inside. I'm gonna let you be my God. I will give, I will receive, I will let you be my God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Everybody here tonight watching by internet, everybody. Say this out loud. I yield myself to the Lordship of Jesus. I yield myself to the Creator God. I confess Jesus as the Lord of my life. I believe He's raised from the dead. Alive right now. Soon to come again. I yield myself to Jesus oh yes I do oh yes I do yes I do if that's the first time you've ever done that you need to let us know right or email us or call us if you're here in this building let somebody in person know before you go out people will be moving around and going out to back you come down to the front if that's the first time you've ever confessed Jesus as Lord, there'll be people standing here ready to confirm with you and encourage and shout with you because it's big stuff that you're born into the family of God and you'll never be alone and without help again. Right. Hallelujah. How many teachable people do I have in the place tonight? Correctable. You'll receive a reproof, a correct. You'll take a rebuke and smile and say, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Right? This is how you get wise and become wiser and attain unto wise counsels, the Bible said. We're singing again as we're dismissed. Sunday morning, God's going to be here. Hallelujah. Be here with the wisdom of God. We're going to shout in praise. We're dismissed as we say. I'm going to yield myself, yield myself to the Holy Spirit. I'm going to yield myself every day and night to the unction of God. I'm going to yield myself, yes I am, to the Holy Spirit. I'm going to 